Uh, for our first four weeks at Watermark here, we're going to be considering four value words. Three of them are going to be fairly familiar to you if you've been at Holy Trinity for more than two weeks, probably. Um, rest, reflect, redirect. They're on the front of our liturgy covers every, every single week. And then I'm going to add to that a third, reconnect. Rest, reflect, redirect, and reconnect. Four simple, centering words to guide us, to anchor us, to fill us as we inhabit this new place together and in all that that includes for us. And today we begin with the word rest. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come. Somebody once said that God's favorite word may be come. <laughs> Jesus says, go, go make disciples of all nations. He says, love one another as I have loved you. He says, give. He says, pray. He says, repent. He says, serve. He says, heal. He says, preach. Yet here, he says, come. Just come. That's it. Come to me, he says. And you'll notice throughout the passage, the personal pronoun is emphatic. It's me, me, my, my, I, I. Come to me, says Jesus. Don't come to a particular philosophy or religion or place of safety or politics. He says, no, come to me, a living and breathing person. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And notice here how Jesus only invites a certain kind of person to come to him. It's those who are weary and burdened. Those who do not feel strong and do not feel like they have what it takes. It reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount. It begins with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, come, all of you who are working hard and carrying too much, who are fatigued and exhausted and weighed down by the burdens of your life. And there's two words that Jesus used here to describe the people that he's inviting to himself. The first word in the Greek is an active word. It means you are doing an action. You are living or working in such a way that is wearing yourself out and causing yourself exhaustion. You are doing the action. And the second word that's used is in the passive in the Greek. In other words, other people or circumstances are acting upon you, and you are bearing the burden of others or from being in particular circumstances. So things that you are doing that are wearing you out, and things and circumstances that are happening to you that are burdening you and exhausting you. And the cumulative effect of both these realities is a sense of being overwhelmed and overworked and overscheduled and overanxious, a people who feel like the juice has gone out of life and all that's left is the rind. Come to me, says Jesus, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's that little four-letter word, <laughs> rest. Something which the human soul longs for and which we find so elusive. Rest. Literally, it could be translated, I will rest you. I will refresh you. So the picture that Jesus is giving here is not come to me and I'm going to give you a nice packaged gift that you can then walk away and enjoy by yourself totally apart from me. No, Jesus is saying the image is I will rest you. I will refresh you. Come to me. In other words, this is something that you cannot have apart from me. And this word rest brings us all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, doesn't it? Genesis chapter 2. God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it God rested from all his work and everything he had done in creation. Now, what does it mean when God rests? I don't think it means God ceases doing things. The world would cease to exist were he to do that. <laughs> I also don't think it means that God just kicks it into neutral and kind of puts his feet up on a lawn chair and says, this is great vacation after all this work. I think when God rests, it means God is entering into the reason for which he created. And he is bringing creation into the wholeness 
for which he made it. So come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will lead you into the wholeness and the fullness for which you were originally created. I will rest you, and I will refresh you. And you will find rest for your souls, he says. Deep down in your souls. Body and mind can remain weary if the soul is not at rest. I think this is one of the things that I've discovered in, in, uh, as I've had children. It's, it's possible to go on vacation and not experience rest. <laughs> it's possible to observe the Sabbath and not experience rest. It's possible to cease doing work and not know deep rest. And that's not just for people that have kids. That's for all of us. Augustine had it right. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. We can be on Sabbath and on vacation and still experiencing that inner restlessness of heart that is not satisfied by the one who offers us rest. And so Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary in heaven, and you will find rest for your souls. How? Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Now, in the ancient world, this is the last thing that you would expect anybody to say if they're talking about rest. (laughs) A yoke is an image of work, of really intensive, demanding, consistent, ongoing, sometimes back-breaking work. And so, take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest for your souls. That seems like a contradiction of terms. That seems like a total paradox. So how is a yoke the means by which Jesus brings rest to our souls? Is the question that would have been the burden of Jesus' disciples as they heard these words. And I think the the answer comes in, in that if Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he has this sense in here that, that fatigue and exhaustion and burnout is not from carrying a yoke. It's from carrying the wrong yoke. It's from carrying the wrong yoke. And so there's this invitation, take my yoke upon you. He's saying, there needs to be a transfer of yokes in your life. The question is never, will I wear a yoke? It's whose yoke am I wearing? The question is never, will I be a disciple? It's whose disciple am I being? The question is never, will I look for rest? It's, where am I seeking rest? So here, Jesus is saying, You are overburdened because you're wearing the wrong yoke. You need to take my yoke. But that begs the question, what is Jesus' yoke? And I think the key here comes actually surprisingly before our passage. Oftentimes when you get this verse on a a card or something like that, or somebody writes it to you, which they should, it's a great verse. It starts in verse 28, right? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But notice how in Matthew, Jesus starts speaking in verse 25 in this section. And I think when we miss verses 25, 26, 27, we actually miss what the yoke and the rest actually is that he's giving us. So he says, at that time, Jesus declared, verse 25, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do, or for such was your gracious will. So the image that we get of Jesus here as he's about to issue this command of come to me is you get this wonderful picture of Jesus in relationship to his heavenly father. And note, this is Jesus, the eternal Son of God. And so this relationship to his Father has been an eternal relationship that he has enjoyed before the foundation of the world. And Jesus here turns to his Father in joyful prayer and praise. And if you look at the verses just before it, he does this in response to the fact that people do not like him, they are against him, and they are rejecting his message. So it's precisely in a moment when Jesus and his disciples could have been most profoundly discouraged by the way that the world is responding to the circumstances and who Jesus is, that Jesus finds himself raptured in thanksgiving and praise and delight in who his father is, in particular in his father's lordship and wise and gracious sovereignty. 
There's this sense in which when the world doesn't respond to you the way you wish it would, Jesus sees behind that world a father who is not phased, who is completely secure, who is at work in all things. And Jesus says, I praise you, Father. I thank you. For such was your gracious will. And then he makes this profound declaration in verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now this is astonishing right here. I mean, Jesus is like giving us a little glimpse into the eternal, internal life of the Holy Trinity. And he's saying that within the one being of God, there is a personal reciprocity and a relational intimacy of knowing and being known. Only the Son knows the Father, and only the Father knows the Son. And it's from within this context that then Jesus says in verse 28, Come to me, all who are la labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So what is the yoke that Jesus says is going to give us rest? I think it's the yoke that Jesus has had his whole existence for all eternity. It's this relationship with the Father. So when he says to us, come to me, he is speaking from within this eternal communion with the Father. And he's saying, knowing this God is the only yoke and the only burden and the only reality that is going to bring true rest to the restlessness of your souls. There simply is no other rest that will abide. So Jesus says, come, enter into my knowing of the Father. I've known him for all eternity. Come, enter into my praise of the Father. It's really delightful. Come, enter into my communion with the Father. It holds true in every circumstance and situation. Come, enter into my obedience to the Father. It's not such a heavy burden after all. And it's not so that you don't have to work. It's not so that you can somehow escape the demands and the sufferings and the real hardships of this world. But it's so that all your working and all your suffering and all your hardships and all your responsibilities flow out of a soul that is deeply satisfied and at rest. As we begin this new season in a new facility, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> if you were here the hour and a half before the service, you would have seen chaos. Absolute chaos. It's going to be a, a communal effort of kind of rebuilding in some ways together. Now, some of us find that really exciting, and others of us are like, oh. The God's given us lots of energy, lots of gifts. And he's inviting us to share those with one another in this time. It's exciting. But I also recognize that in a new season, especially coming out of the last 14 to 16 months we've had, there are plenty of us that have a little bit of fatigue and weariness settling in. Does anybody agree with that? Okay, thank you. There was too much silence in, in relation to that. I didn't want to be that one. I mean, the cumulative effects of pandemic fatigue are a real thing. People who thought they were doing great for the whole year all of a sudden, like, we're coming out of this and boom, it's hitting me. I just don't have half the energy I used to. Mental health and medical professionals are leaving their fields at alarming, unprecedented rates. Mayors are choosing not to run for office who had things lined up before COVID ever hit. And what's the reason between all of them? It's exhaustion, sadness, fatigue. And already I've talked to some people who are saying, I am, I am amazed how coming out of this quarantine, how overscheduled and busy I am already coming out of COVID. That's the one thing I didn't want to do. I said, I love how slow my life has gotten during this time if I had a stable job and had that blessing. And that's the one thing I want to do. I don't want to come out and go back to the pace I was before and boom, I'm there within a month or two. Some people are experiencing relational weariness like they've lost people that are close to them. Just in my family, a cousin died a week ago because of COVID. You think you've made it all this way. You're just at the end. 
and it still strikes. Changing friendships. I've talked to a number of people who said, There's, my closest friend is no longer in our church. Or um, a lot of my friendships have fractured and frayed so much that I'm almost starting over again socially. And there's a weariness to that in these new social dynamics. And then some of us are just feeling restless. We want to do anything we can to leave 2020 behind us <laughs> and just start a whole new life because it's kind of painful to have to deal with the healing that's maybe needed there. And the greatest thing about our passage here is that Jesus just says, come. He doesn't give five principles for how to deal with it. He doesn't say, oh, it's all going to be over in a couple weeks. Don't worry about it. He doesn't give us pious platitudes. He just says, come. It's as simple as that. No conditions, no prerequisites. Just come. And I will rest you. I will rejuvenate you. There's this lovely hymn called, Oh, love that will not let me go. And I wonder if that's what some of us need in this season. I would like to read it to you. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's bla blaze its day may brighter and fairer be. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red, life that shall endless be. Come to me, says Jesus, all who are weary and burdened, and I will rest you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.